In this next tutorial, we're going to follow up the use of modifiers for modeling components of a model. In this particular case, it's the stapler. Turns out modifiers are really useful for helping with this. We're not going to use subdivision surfaces for this object. I have done a video where I talked about modeling without subdivision surfaces, and it seemed to pique a lot of people's interest. So we're going to combine a modifying stack for modeling along with a direct modeling approach that doesn't require subdivision surfaces, since this is a hard body type of model. So I just want to say before we get going too much further, I am recording this tutorial using Blender's light theme because profiles show up better. So please don't make comments about the fact that I'm using the light theme. Inevitably, I get comments of people saying, why are you using an old version of Blender? This is Blender 4.1. Since normals are important for this tutorial, let's cover some basics of normals before we start for those who may be new to 3D. A normal is a vector that's perpendicular to a surface at a given point. In 3D graphics, normals are crucial for both modeling and shading. For instance, we can move a polygon along its normal direction. There are two types of normals. Vertex normals, these are associated with individual vertices of a polygon. And surface normals, these are computed by averaging the vertex normals of a polygon. Normals play a key role in computing how light interacts with a surface, determining its shading. Let's break this down. Triangles, the simplest polygons, are always planar or flat. Quads, which are composed of two triangles, are more commonly used in 3D modeling, but may not always be planar. To create the illusion of smooth, curved surfaces, 3D software uses a technique called normal averaging. Vertex normals of connected polygons are averaged. Shading is then blended across the surface based on these averaged normals. This creates the appearance of curvature, even on flat geometry. While this smoothing technique is valuable for creating realistic-looking surfaces, it's not always desirable. Sometimes you need areas of your model to appear flat, even when connected to curved sections. This is particularly important when you have obvious curving regions of a mesh connected to regions that need to be both physically and visually flat. Controlling how normals affect shading in these situations is crucial for achieving the desired look in your 3D models. That's exactly what this tutorial will help you master. So the starting point are some profiles that I have created. This could have been a bitmap that you had planned out that you would put in as a template. I just happen to have some profiles that I've blocked out for this part of the stapler. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and build it. I've started my templates, so they're basically at the center of the universe. They're offset a little bit. Let's do Shift S, cursor to selected. And there we can see that is basically zero along the Y axis, which is really the most important axis that we're going to reference right now. Now, I'm also going to come over here and switch my unit system over to metric because there are a lot of people who are on metric and I'm always using inches. I'm going to go ahead and set centimeters there as my units. We're only going to really focus on this half on the left side for right now. So shift A, let's come over and add a cube that's one centimeter. And I'm going to come up. My first reference point is this right here, which is the height basically of the object. So S, we're going to scale that up, and then let's look at this in the top view. So this is the component of the stapler that houses the staples, and it's got this metal thickness. So S key. Now I've got to correct back in the front view, S, Z. So let's do this. Let's come over here and Option Z to go into X-ray. S, X, about like that. So I'm going to move through this pretty quickly because we really want to get to the modifier part. Okay, Command A, let's go ahead and apply rotation and scale so that we don't have to deal with that. Tab key takes us into edit mode and we want to remove the top, back, and this bottom polygon. So we're going to delete those faces. Let's come into the top here and take a look at this. So we're going to create thickness right here, and we could do this with a modifier, but remember the modifiers work 
by handing data off one modifier to the next, but it doesn't hand the data off to the user. So there are a couple of things that we need to do with traditional modeling before we hand off the data to a modifier stack. So this is one of them. Let's come over here and add a loop right there. Let's go ahead and add three. And in face mode, I'll take both of these. Let's look at this from the side. So this is the first time that we're going to look at one of the template pieces. So there's a notch at the top up here. And I'm going to press X, Y, and we'll scale right to about that point. And then I'm going to press X to delete that. And in fact, we're going to use one of the first modifiers as a mirror modifier that we'll use in just a minute. But let's come over here and press the K key to activate the knife tool. Click here to here and then up like that. And then we're in face mode. We'll go ahead and delete that face. So the first thing that we want to do is focus on a rounding that happens around the perimeter right here. We do need to encode that in the geometry itself. So this will be a direct polygon modeling operation. And because we are doing direct polygon modeling, we really need to consider the resolution of our, of our geometry. So we're going to come over to the bevel function and let's go ahead and bevel this. We don't need a very big one for the inside. Okay. But again, we really need to consider the resolution. So I'm going to take this up to 12. And I think that'll work pretty well. So let's come into the top, press the A key, switch over to the extrude along normals. We're going to give this some thickness right about like that. Now, the thing that we need to consider and that we really want to be aware of, we need to make a decision at this point about what we want to do with large planar regions relative to these curving regions. There are two directions that we could go at this point. One where we manually put in boundary loops to control the shading because we've got these long flat areas that we want to appear flat and there's going to be surface normal blending between these. And if you don't control for this one way or another, you'll get subtle curvature that appears across the surface, even though it's technically flat because of the vertex normal blending that controls the shading. So in this particular case, we are actually going to use some modifier functions that Blender has to control vertices. It really just depends on what direction that you want to go. So since we're using modifiers, we'll go the modifier route. Okay, so we've got that in place. And the next thing that we need to do is add some cutouts. In fact, let's do this. I, I, I missed one opportunity here. Let's zoom back in and leave edit mode. We don't have shade smooth turned on. Blender is the only 3D application I've used that doesn't have any kind of surface normal blending turned on by default. It's an oddity to me. So let's come over here and turn on shade smooth. And we're going to run into a change that was made in 4.1 that a lot of people did not like. When you do shade smooth, it blends the surface normals of adjacent polygons, regardless of the angle. We now have to control that with the modifier. So let's come in and add two modifiers to this. Let's go ahead and mirror this. So we'll do the first one, which is a mirror modifier. Then we need to come in and add under normals, a smooth by angle. So that used to be a menu option, but it's now been moved to the modifier. Okay. So the next thing that we need to finally get to is doing some cutouts. Now we could use a Boolean operation, but I like the knife project since I've got profiles that are already here and I don't need to create a 3d object from it. So the way that this works is I've got these, all these templates that I've drawn as Bezier curves. They could either be Bezier curves or they could be other polygon meshes. It's just the perimeter that we're really interested in. So I want to be inside of edit mode for the polygon mesh. And then you, you just come over and select the template object, which is template one right here. And you want to make sure that the view is looking through the axis along which you want to project. Then come up to mesh and then just do a knife project and make sure in this case, cut through is enabled. 
and there it goes. Now let's come over and we just want to remove these parts. So again, I could have done a Boolean operation, but I'm just going to do it this way because it's easy. And we need to fill this because there's now a hole right here. So in edge mode, we will select that. And then you just do a new face from edges. It creates an end gone that's kind of filled funny, but that's okay. Press the one key to switch over to vertex mode. Press the J key there. And then we'll do the same thing here, J key. And that gets us nice quads to work with. There's another cutout, the template two right here. This is another cutout where you can actually look in and you can see the staples. So as you're using the staples up, you can tell if you're getting close to those being empty. We need to create a template to project. Let's leave edit mode for the primary mesh that we're working on. And now with just this template two selected tab key. So I need to select just a single vertex here, command L to select that. I need to extract this to actually create the projection profile. So shift and D escape and then P key will allow us to separate that to become its own object, which we can see right there. So let's leave edit mode for that and we'll select just this one. So let's actually convert this into a polygon mesh, but I want to increase the resolution a, a little bit more. Again, because we're considering the resolution of our geometry, then we just need to bring up the context menu and convert this explicitly to a polygon mesh. Now, when we tab to go into edit mode, we can see that right here, but it isn't filled. So if I press the A key to select all of the geometry, it's unfilled and I want it filled at this point. So we press the F key and then let's zoom in a little bit closer. Take the top point and the bottom point, press the J key to connect those to divide that end gone in half. Let's go into face mode and, and move this over, but we need to make sure that it is split. G key X, and we'll move that right about there. Two key, and then we'll select these center edges, and then we will bridge those two together. We need to remember to remove these interior edges because those would also get projected and we don't want that to happen. We just want the perimeter. So we'll come down and do a dissolve edges, remembering to turn off the dissolve vertices because that would have changed the profile a little bit. So let's come over now and turn off a couple of these profiles that we've already used that we don't need anymore. Okay, so let's leave edit mode for that and let's come back into the main object, press the tab key and let's come back into the front view because that is the axis through which we're going to project. Select here the template and we come back up to mesh and we come down to knife project, but we're going to see a problem. The problem is that anytime you try and cut a hole in a polygon, whether it's an n-gon or a quad, polygons don't like to have holes cut into them and it needs to have a connection to the outer perimeter. It's going to automatically create that for us if it doesn't find a way to do that. And this is going to produce problems. So let's undo. And since we're still in edit mode for our primary object, let's press the K key and put a cut in there for it. So I'm going to click here. Z key for constraint and then C key to project the knife all the way through, click and return. So that produces the cut for us. So we still have the projection profile active. We're still in edit mode. So now we can come back to mesh and we can do a knife project, making sure that we have cut through enabled. And there we go. So now we just bring up the context menu and we do a bridge edge loops and it cuts that through for us so again you could have gone the route of doing a boolean but six of one half dozen of another this gets us to where we need to be we've got one more feature to project in there's a little design feature on the side of it that we'll go ahead and replicate because it does fit into this modifier thing so i'm going to leave edit mode let's select this and we're going to follow the same process we need to create an explicit profile. So tab key, select a single vertex, command or control L, shift and D, escape. And then the P key, 
separates that to become its own object. So that's way down here. In fact, I don't need that template anymore. And let's leave edit mode and select just this. Again, let's increase the resolution from 12 to 20, give ourselves just a little bit more resolution to work with. Bring up the context menu. And again, we will convert this to a mesh tab key. So it's gonna be similar to what we've done before. A key, F to fill, and then we just need to divide that in half, J key, three, and we will split that so it's dissociated. And I'm just gonna pull this off to the side. I'm not gonna go the full length because we're only, we're working on a shortened version right now, two key, and then we will bridge those edge loops and then dissolve those two edges. Okay, that's correct. Okay, so, so let's go ahead and project this. So we need to leave edit mode for that, come back to our primary object, primary 3D object, come into edit mode, and then select the projection template. Let's do a K key, Z, C, and click. So now we can immediately just come back in and do the knife project. And in this case, we don't want to cut through. This isn't a hole. This is sort of an embossed feature that's on there. Okay. So we only want it on the outside at this point. So let's come over here and turn off that template. And immediately what we're going to do is press the I key to do an inset right down to about there. Now this is going to be an indented feature, a slight indented feature. My actual stapler had this feature on there. We're going to come over and use a loop cut, click and add that. Let's go ahead and press option Z so that we can only sort of focus on this area. Let's select just this and I'm going to pull it in just a little ways like that. So this is going to be a beveling feature that's going to be there with a modifier, but I just needed to prepare just that projection. In fact, let's come here now and we don't need these anymore. So we'll go ahead and hide those. So those are no longer needed. In fact, I don't think I need this one either. So get all that visual clutter out of the way. So we have prepared the primary object and the next stage is to begin adding some more modifiers to control detail. Now let's just stop and consider for a moment what we're doing. Let's come back into edit mode here. Let's press the two key to go into edge mode and we will do a test here. If you were going down the route where you wanted to put in bounding polygons that prevent shading from going from curved regions into flat regions, then you would come in with the bevel function. You would go into a two one configuration and we would add polygons like that. And then we would come in, we would reselect these and then we would change to something like, let's do a nine by 0.5, which is the default rounding profile. And we would add the bevels and we have these polygons, which are planar. So these polygons here function as a control for the shading. It's a subtle effect in this particular case, but when you're trying to be very precise with hard body modeling, you want to consider these. This would be the manual way of approaching it. But in fact, we're going to back up and we're going to use a modifier to control this shading for us so that you don't really have to think about it. What the modifier stack does is it gives us a non-destructive editing ability in case we want to come back and change some of these radiuses. Let's come in now and add the next modifier in the stack, which is going to be under generate and it's going to be bevel. By default, what's going to happen is it's going to just bevel every angle. And we don't want that to be the case. We want to control this and we're going to do it via a weight mechanism. And by default, all of the edges have a weight value of zero. When we use the weight mechanism, it has an absolute largest value that you need to determine. So for instance, if you knew that 
you're not going to have any bevels that go above a particular size, then you need to set that size as the dominant maximum value. And in this particular case, I think what I want to do is set the value to something like half a centimeter. Well, let's just leave this and sort of let's do shift S cursor to selected. Let's just visualize this. So if I had a cube in, let's put in a half centimeter cube and imagine a full fillet going from that corner to that corner. That would be the maximum fillet. Everything else is going to be a fraction of that value that you define. So that's why I define that. I didn't think there would be anything that would produce a larger value than that. So what we want to do now is come in, press the N key, and where it says mean bevel weight under edge data, we're going to put in a value of 0.1. And look at that. So let's come in and increase the number of divisions. So we're going to come over now to this area. We've got an edge here, here. And well, well, we'll do this one. Let's do this one by itself. So let's kind of find a bevel value. So if we put in uh, 0.1, in fact, let's do this. Let's do 0 0.08. And this one and this one and the one down at the bottom, we'll do... 0.06, something about like that. I think that works pretty well. So again, remember, we aren't putting boundaries on here. So we're going to be taking care of this shading issue that's going to come up in just a bit with another modifier. But let's continue down. Let's do a loop select around that perimeter and this perimeter. The real model, the actual stapler that I had when I was looking at this, has a slight rounding around there that's apparent enough to go ahead and produce it. So in this, we're going to come back again to mean bevel weight, and we'll do 0 0.03, and look at that, produces that right around there. So the weighting mechanism is really nice. It works really well. So let's come over now, take a look at this. So here again, we just need to come in and figure out a value for this. So let's do 0 0.05, and then you can just play with it, 0 0.08, and you can get it right to about like that. And then I'm going to do a slight one for the interior. So this would be 0 0.02, and I like that. I think that's going to work. So we produce this blending from this flat area and then back out, and I just think that works really well. It's such a cool feature. So the next thing that we need to consider is that on the geometry, we're also going to be having a little bit of bevel around the perimeter, but we're going to run into a problem now. So if I double click, in fact, let, let's select both of these inner and outer boundaries. I will go into face mode and double click on an edge and it produces that loop for us. We need to operate on the boundary loop. So come up to select loop select boundary loop and there we go now watch what happens if i try and come in here and add a bevel weight to this it starts doing some kind of funky here and this is a condition that's going to happen that you can run into it starts running into two kind of a complex of a situation so i'm going to undo and we need to actually set this up with another modifier to handle these edges so let's create, let's, in fact, let's come over here into vertex mode. We need to create a vertex group for these, but we need to be aware of what's happening, how Blender handles this. Press the N key to remove that. We have a series of vertices selected, and they do something actually pretty smart. You can see that there's a blend going between this selected vertex and one down here that isn't selected. But we have fills being visible between some of the vertices. So for instance, here we've got a, poly, a vertex, 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 which forms a filled polygon. And that is letting us know that any modifier that acts on these is going to see a connection between these, and it may throw a wrench in the works for a modifier like the bevel modifier. And we need to make this a little bit more predictable. So let's come over first and we're going to create a group and we'll call this perimeter and then we need to assign these but we need to add in some new geometry 
in this case a loop cut, we will do a loop cut that goes all the way around, click, and you're going to note that if I come over here and do a select, it automatically interpolated these new vertices as being part of the selection because they were in between two vertices that were in the vertex group. So we need to take these and remove those. Okay, so now we can come in and reselect, and you want to look for these regions that still have fills in them. So we're still going to get some problems that show up. So what we need to do is add in a little bit more geometry. I'm going to press the K key, start right around over here, click X key, and then C to project all the way through and return. Now I'm going to select just this new loop and we want to deselect it, but there are two points here and here that I don't want to have removed from the selection. So we come over here and we do a remove and then we reselect to look and to make sure that we only have vertices along the perimeter where we want the bevel to be established. And it looks like that's going to work. In fact, I'm going to come to the back here too, and I'm going to have us remove these polygons. It's going to be inside the model X key, and we're not going to see those. Okay. So let's come over here again, do a select. So now we're ready to establish the bevel around the perimeter by adding another bevel modifier. And in this case, we're going to go not from angle, but to vertex group. It's going to be enormous at 10 centimeters. So let's, let's take this to a small value 0 0.01. We need to establish the perimeter as the vertex group to be used. And there we go. So now we can see that going around. Let's go ahead and add a few more segments. Probably four is quite sufficient. It's a small detail, but if we hadn't gone to that work, you would have gotten some really weird results. And I wanted to go through this so that you could be really cognizant of how it is that you have to be aware of what's happening with these vertices to understand what's happening when you're using the limit method being in vertex group. So let's take a look at this now in shaded view. It's tab key and option Z to leave edit mode. And when we zoom in, we can see that we have some hard boundaries going on right here. So next we're going to start looking at some shading. So we need to figure something out here to deal with this. Now this would be a very small detail, right? Probably wouldn't see it, but for the sake of this exercise, we're going to deal with it. We've got a clear hard boundary there. Well, if we come to the second bevel modifier, which is using the vertex group, we can come down to shading and we can tell it to use the hard and normal function. And look at that. It creates nice shading. So what's that doing? It's looking at the fact that there is a large polygon here and we've got all these small angled polygons. And by default, it would normally produce this hard boundary. So if we come back over here and we look at it, it would just break the shading because we have the smooth modifier at a 30 degree angle that's breaking things. So what do we do? We, we could come in here and turn on this hard normals, which will automatically override that because it's downstream and it will produce a blending. It takes the, the vertex of this large n-gon and imposes it on the vertex that it's adjoining to for these smaller polygons and it maintains the flatness and then starts to create visible curvature only in the area that you want it to be. It's a visual trick of sorts, but we have a limitation with that. If we come back over here and we look at this, you can still clearly see that there's a hard boundary here and a hard boundary here. If we come back over to the original bevel and we turn on its hard normals, nothing happens. Again, because the geometry has now been handed off to the second bevel modifier, and so we don't see the effect of it trying to affect normals. So we've got sort of this compounding issue with surface shading happening, but it turns out there's a neat way that we can solve this with yet another modifier. So let's come in here really quick and let's just name, I want to name both of my bevel modifiers. So this one is 
bevel.weight method, and the second one is bevel.group method. Just, I like to have those visual names there. So uh, in this case, we're not even going to worry about trying to do any kind of hard, hard normaling and shading control with these. We're going to introduce another modifier under edit called weighted normal. And I've done an entire video on this, but watch what happens when we add this is that it automatically cleans up those hard visible boundaries that we don't want to be there because the previous bevel modifier now hands off the geometry to weighted normals. And what weighted normals does is something that's actually really cool. It looks at the relationships between adjoining polygons and it sees that there are a bunch of relatively small polygons adjoining much larger polygons, whether it's quad or big n gons, and it says, wow, the area of these flat polygons should be flat since the polygons are flat, and it imposes the normals from these big polygons onto the adjoining smaller polygons and prevents vertex blending from happening. So the shading comes from this small polygon to this perimeter. And this perimeter has the flat shading. And so you get proper shading between these areas, between these large flat areas and the curving areas. And it's just doing some smart calculations to make sure you have curvature where you want curvature and flat where you want to be flat. And that's what the weighted normal modifier does. Okay. So we we're, were able to take care of everything through the use of these modifiers. Now, the interesting thing to note is that we could backtrack to this smooth angle modifier. At this point, it's not doing anything anymore. So we come over and we, let me rotate this. If I come over and just turn this off, it's no longer having any effect because the bevel modifiers have introduced new geometry that's having a large effect on the shading. And they then are handing off their geometry to the weighted normal function, which is controlling the vertex normal smoothing on a polygon by polygon basis. And so we no longer need that smooth by angle modifier at all. And there we go. All we need to do now is come in, go into edit mode, option Z, and we can, I'm in select box, and I can pull this out like this to match up to the template that I had, and we are done. The great thing that's just so awesome about this is let's come back to the first bevel, bevel modifier. We can come in and because it's non-destructive, I can come back, let's say for, uh, let's do this. Let's come over and select these edges here. And we determined that we wanted to change N key, the weight of just those, we still have the ability to do that because it's being handled by a modifier. So I hope you found this to be a really useful tutorial.